We are in Luke 16. And um, really, this, this is wonderful because we're hearing parables, events, stories of Jesus that we've heard through our lives now fall into context into a time frame as Jesus is teaching straight through. And I'm, I'm loving it. I'm still just loving it. It is so amazing. Um, right now he is dealing with the Pharisees. Um, again, he's on his, eventually on his way to Jerusalem to the end. Uh, but now he has just... Out of all grace, out of all grace, out of all grace, warning the Pharisees. He, he's reminding believers what it means to follow Him, and yet He is still not writing off the Pharisees and those who are religious. He's firing a warning shot across their bow time after time after time. And he's just told the believers, you are to be stewards of what God has given you. Because he has saved you, you are saved for this purpose. To be generous with what God has given you. And not to be lovers of money. And he turns then the canon straight at the Pharisees and says, do not be lovers of money like them. And then he says, the religious people today, they think they have a standing before God because of these things. We talked about this last week. That um, truly, deep down, their, inten their, intents, their intentions are corrupt. Um, they're antagonistic towards God's demands. They're not listening to Christ. They're slandering Him. Remember, they were mocking Him. And... In other words, they are justifying themselves. They're saying, I have been made right before God because I brought God down. I brought myself up to this level. I used God's law for the wrong purpose instead of being convicted by it. I've now turned it into a system of bringing me to moral perfection in front of God. And so they've justified themselves and they've done it in the, in, in the eyes of men. Everything they do is for the eyes of men, but inside, darkness. They're hypocrites in everything they do. God is not in them. They do not know the way. They do not know God at all. And so at this point, Christ is going to give them the ultimate consequence of their decision and their lifestyles here and their judgments. And he's going to bring up the topic of hell. Hell. This is a hard thing to teach. I mean, for me, I know the faithful pastor has to teach about hell. We have to teach about sin. And it's uncomfortable. It is. It's, it's the most uncomfortable thing because... In me, I, I, I studied this out. It's like, oh, the richness in this story. I didn't understand the depth of the rich man in Lazarus. That's what we're looking at here. Um, there's so much truth packed in here that it's going to take today and next week to go through it. And so I revel in the truth of God. It's just unbelievable that, number one, I, I'm not going to be there. I'm in Christ, and, and I praise God for that. But then the flip side of it is those I know that are heading toward that. And it, it's like, God, never make me so hardened that you know I, I just overlook and think, oh, God, it's all under your control. I have nothing to do with the destination of other people. It's like, no, this is hell. And Jesus is going to explain what hell is. And it's, and it's just, and it's 
God who created heaven. It is God who created hell. And, you know, I can think in my mind, it, it's just not fair that people are going there. But I submit to God and I say, this is all of you. I, I don't understand it. I understand how the hardened people that hate you outright, they should be sent there. They're going to get what they want. But there's so many people in this world that with good intentions think they're going to be there. And this story, the reality of this story is the jolt that they're not in heaven. That is the scary, scary part. And that is what makes it so uncomfortable for me as a Christian. But we need to understand the reality of what Jesus is saying here. It is so important. As a believer, it's so important for that cause. That we understand this is <coughs> eternity. And all people are immortal. They're going to live forever. This life is a vapor. And they're either going to be here or there. That's the harsh reality of what Jesus is saying. <coughs> And this story also is for anyone that listens to this message to say, wait a minute, am I understanding this right? What, what's going to keep me out of hell? Because Jesus is going to tell this story to reveal what it's like in hell and how to make sure you're not destined for that. And so if you're a believer, you listen to understand who God is, His plan as an unbeliever, and you're not sure about your destination, this is the time to evaluate and say, God, I want to know. Tell me through this. Tell me through this. And for us, we can read it and say, oh, I have assurance. I'm in Christ. I know Scripture. I believe Scripture. I believe what's said. And that, that's the finality of the story. But this, again, is a warning. Understand, it's a loving, compassionate story of Jesus telling the harshness to make sure no one goes there. And the one telling the story is the one to deliver one from this destination. Is that not amazing in itself? Because Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over all. He's Lord over heaven. He is Lord over hell. Satan is not Lord over hell. He's going there as a destination to be punished eternally. Christ is Lord over hell as well as Lord of, over heaven. And that's not normally understood. I mean, God is Lord over all. So we, we go to Luke chapter 16 after that intense introduction, okay? But it, it is so true. Luke 16, verse 14. And the Pharisees who loved money, who are, oh, I'm sorry, jump to 18. But it actually deals with what he just said, but, um, or verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. 
But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from there to us. And he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they not, do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. There's a lot in this. A lot in this. Um, This is a story about the rich man. He's the main character. He is blessed by God. He enjoys the best. Yet, we have this crazy thing going on here. This reversal. Uh, really, this could be called the great reversal. The rich man, the poor man, and all of a sudden, different places. Different places. Um... And we have the rich man here talking. He's the main center character. Yet, the poor man, Lazarus, doesn't say anything. There's nothing. He goes off to heaven. Nothing's really said about heaven. This is about Christ explaining what hell is like. Who's going to be there. And a lot's going to be brought out from looking deep in this. Because I used to read this story and I did see it differently than what I, how I see it now. So, um, <clears throat> we have this very, very rich man. He is very religious, very devout, very active. Um, but it is the essence of those who gained the world and yet lost their soul. Uh, this is going to be the same story as late Luke 13. He's, 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 he's reusing the same points over and over. I want to make sure we understand that. Uh, Luke 13, 24. This is, this is the same, same story, but told in a different way. Luke 13. 1324 says, He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand on the outside, knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you, or know where you came from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evil doers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves are thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. So he's, he's taking, taking this parable here of the narrow gate and uh, the wide expanse open road everybody's heading on that leads to destruction. He's putting this now into a storyline where we have a rich man and a poor man. And the reality of it by putting people in these places. <clears throat> and Jesus being the perfect storyteller, he uses the extremes. The Pharisees love to do this. They love to teach this way. But we're talking a rich man here. And everything it says about the rich man, we can use words like lavishly, uh, superbly, um, 
he, he wore the uh, purple robes um, every day. This is habitually. He's not walking around in civvies during the day and special events putting on the royal. This is purple royal dyed clothes um, that comes from a special dye out of the, the island of Tyre um, that only the very wealthy could afford um, to be to put into the clothing. Um, it says that Lydia, in the book of Acts, she was a seller of this dye, if you remember the story of Lydia. Um, she sold this type of dye. But this is a very, very rich man, and Jesus uses the ex extreme. And he's going to say that this poor man becomes rich, and the rich man becomes poor. Um, he, he, he takes this poor man who has no fee, no food, and this rich man who has feast daily, and flips their place in eternity. Um, something that's amazing is that this man just wanted a crumb, flip this to where now the rich man just wants a drop. So we have a man who has no hope, no hope here, and the other one who's living out hope in life, and then the switch completely around of <coughs> no hope whatsoever, and then to the poor man, hope realized in eternity. Um, and I want to I want to just talk about hope just for a second because. Hope is a common grace that God gives all people in this world. I mean, common graces are, this is God's compassion on all people. He gives us life, He gives us <coughs> breath, He gives us, whether we believe or not, He's giving all humanity these little things. Great things, really. But He's given us this one thing called hope. And anyone can have hope that something's going to get better. That, you know, this job is terrible, this situation is terrible, but it's got to get better. We always have that in the back of our mind. It, it's got to get better. It's got to get better. Um, the reality Jesus is bringing here of hell is this is a place where the worst situation, the worst circumstances remain permanent, no hope. So, he's calling out now. The this, this story is directed at the Pharisees who they should see, I am the rich man. I am the rich man in this story because in their view, they see people who are blessed by God as being prosperous and rich. I mean, the prosperity gospel is the same thing. If, if you follow Christ and he's going to give you all these things, you're blessed by God. If something <coughs> happens to you and um, all these bad things happen to you, you're cursed by God. You need to confess your sin. Well, we know that's not true. I mean, look at Job. That's what his friends all told him. Confess your sin. All this is happening to you because you have sinned. But it says at the beginning, Job was righteous in all he did. The name didn't mean he's perfect. That means he confessed and he stayed in connection with God. <clears throat> and so this rich man speaks. Uh, poor man never says anything. But he's going to give us a testimony from hell. And this warning, this plea, please tell my brothers something that will keep them from coming here. And so Jesus wants everyone listening to the story to pick up, to have that fear of God in your heart. Number one, I don't want to be there because it's a place of, if you look at the words there, torment, agony, and agony. Permanently. Um, we we'll want to keep ourselves from going there and everyone else from going there. So, before we start this, we have to look at this story and say, is this a true story that Jesus is telling? Well, 
anything he says is true. But is this a, a, an actual occurrence that happened, or is this one of his parables? We, we, we have to ask that story. And I have, have to ask that question. Um, because you read through this, you would think it would be a true story because of one thing. What would it be? They so, named the name. Right. Right. With a parable, it's usually all fictitious, and names aren't used. Um, but, I'll explain in a minute, there is a reason that this man is named. But I, I, we have to lean to the side of the parable, and this is why. Um, if you start, if you look at the beginning of this uh, story, in verse 19, how does it start? A certain rich man. Yeah. Generic. Generic. There was a certain rich man. It's the same thing as Luke 10.30, where it says, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. What story was that? There was a certain rich man. The Good Samaritan, right. right. And that was a parable. Uh, Luke 14.16, a certain man was giving a big dinner. And that was, he was talking about who's going to be at the great feast in heaven. Um, also Luke 15, 11, he's given us plenty of cases here. He said, a certain man had two sons. He just had that, Luke 15. The, the prodigal son, the two prodigal sons. Um, and then Luke 19, 12 will be one coming. A certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself. So this is a setup for once upon a time type of thing. A certain person. But this story is intended to identify and memorably give us a spiritual truth of great significance. And the main character has no name, no location. Um, there's actually a couple points in here that, um, that Jesus uses that is not true in actuality, but he uses that to convey a point because... Nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's any way to speak from hell to heaven, back and forth. Um, even in what Jesus says, there's a chasm fixed. But for the point of the story, to drive this point home to these Pharisees, he's going to use Father Abraham, who is their, who's their God, because they think they're connected to him genealogy. Uh, ancestry wise that they're Jewish that they have a right into the kingdom of heaven they think they're entitled because they're Jewish to go to heaven because they're of Abraham but um, <coughs> but here he was given a name um, Lazarus and this is no connection to Mary and Martha because that's the other Lazarus we know, the, the one we do know. Um, but this is a common name and it was used for a purpose in the story. Uh, the Hebrew name is actually Eleazar, but the meaning of it is whom the Lord saved and whom the Lord helped. So this person is one that God had saved. He did not save himself. So really, it's a description of this man more than a name. It's the one who God saved. Um, this poor, wretched man. Um, and that brings out, when it says a poor man, it's that word patakas, um, which should be familiar, I don't know if you remember this word, but Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are the patakas. This is a very important word because it's who we are. It is poor. Blessed are the poor. And it's not just poor, it's destitute. It's beggar. It's cowering on the ground, crying out for anything destitution 
uh, bankruptcy, desperation. And Jesus said, those who are desperate will come to me and I will give them mercy. Um, so that's the linkage there. This is the Patakas man. He is poor, um, extreme poverty. And every day he's at the gate of the rich man. Um, I don't know if your version of the Bible said he was laid at the gate of the rich man. Anybody have that in their version? The word is balo. <laughs> There's no laid there. He was thrown there. He was thrown there. In other words, somebody abandoned him there. They're like, can't take care of this man anymore. He is paralyzed. He is. He can't do anything. Laid. Yeah. Yeah. Laid. yeah. It, that's a mistranslation of the word balo. Balo means to throw. Anywhere it's used in the New Testament. Um, he was thrown there and left to lay. Um, so he's He's abandoned, he's paralyzed, and he's at this gate, and this word for gate is a big gate in front of a large estate that this rich man owns. And it's a great portal to a great mansion. Um, and every day, the rich man passes. He doesn't know his name. He does nothing. He is just like the Pharisee. The Pharisee won't have anything to do with the sinner, the tax collector, the prostitutes. They're just too far gone. They're not good enough. There's no hope for them. Um, this is the same way, and it is exactly the same way as one of the parables where they walk right by the man in the street. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? This is the exact same thing. He walks right by every day and doesn't even acknowledge the man lying there. I need to jump back for a second. The name Lazarus. I mean, Jesus uses this name Lazarus as a poor man. I, I, I looked through the timetable of Events I've got where it's listed out. It takes the four Gospels and puts them chronologically in order. Because we don't know Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, kind of how they mesh together. And so I look, I got the list, and Jesus at this time is telling the story of Lazarus. The very next event is him going to Bethany and raising Lazarus his friend from the dead. I didn't know that connection. But here you have, uh, that's amazing, that Jesus is telling them, you won't even believe if someone's raised from the dead. And here he's going to actually go do it to a man named Lazarus. And do you remember the Pharisees' response to Lazarus being raised from the dead? What did they want to do? Kill him. They wanted to kill him. That's how hardened their heart was. So that was amazing to see. That's going to be the next step here. As Jesus leaves, he goes to Bethany um, to be with Mary and Martha and raise Lazarus. Um, but this Patakas man here, um, the best way to translate the word Patakas is wretched. And we all know the word wretched, right? From what song? Amazing grace. A wretch saving a wretch like me. That is the word patakas in the Greek. So, this man is desperate. He's lying out there. Um, he's desiring. It says he is longing Longing, just the crumbs falling from the table of this man. Uh, this is the same longing that we find the prodigal son at his most desperate point where he longed to feed on the pods of the pigs and no one would give him anything. And this is a man who is longing every day and this man passes by him with phony religion. 
not taking the time. But the thing about crumbs falling from the table, if we go back in time to that setup of a rich man at a feast, the way they did this <clears throat> was they would serve all the food and they would serve bread and they'd take the bread and they'd dip it in the different stews and use bread for that purpose. But then when they were all done or during the, the course of the meal, their hands would be dirty and they would need a napkin. Well, they, use, they didn't use cloth in that day. Instead, they used bread because it would absorb. And so everyone would take and wipe their dirty hands with the bread and throw it under the table. <laughs> Try that at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but this, this is the way it worked. And, and what happened then, um, later on, they would allow the dogs from the outside. And back then, dogs did not, were not domesticated pets with little ribbons in their hair and um, pampered. They were half wild and uh, type of beast. They would just let come in and let them do the cleaning. Okay? So this man is laying out there longing just to be one of those dogs licking up <coughs> these dirty crumbs from people's hands. So he's painting a picture here of complete extremes. This man, fine linen, he's got Egyptian cloth, purple robes every day. Um, and he's living a life of, it says, gaily living in splendor every day. It's extravagant. And it's the same thought as the man who had the bigger barn. Remember that parable about the man with the barns? He said, I need to build, build bigger ones so I can store more, so I can eat, drink, and be merry. That was the purpose of his life. It was all about me, me, me. I'm going to do that. And so this man is the same thing. Same thing. He's living in that same lifestyle, as, uh, in that same thought process. It's all about me. Now, that was life. Then we have this change of now death happens. And death. Um, when we go back to the passage here, um, it said the time came. So uh, there's always that time that comes. That time will eventually show up and God will demand an account. Um, so that time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about the angels carrying people to heaven. Um, this is like, it's, it's a thought like Elijah, who, he was the only one that um, rode out of this world in a chariot of fire straight in his physical form to heaven. And just like Enoch, who walked, and one day he was gone. He just went into the presence of God. Um, but here he's saying for the point of this story that he was carried into heaven. So he's, he's there. He, not, even, not even, this is heaven to the Jew. They, they know that Abraham is at God's side. They know that is the place of blessing. And it's called Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side. It, it's that place of honor at the banquet table. I mean, we've had many illustrations already that Jesus has given us about the banquet table set up of the host. He always gave the place of honor to his right hand side. And so everybody's jockeying. They want that position. They keep trading favors to get the more honor and work their way up. And here we have this poor man, this wretched man, now seated in the place of honor with Abraham. So this has to be a shock to the Pharisees. Jesus shocks them all the time with his stories. Remember, he always puts it here and then he takes it a level higher, he takes it a level higher. Um, so they're all thinking, this, this rich man, he's the good guy. Then all of a sudden, Jesus says, 
wait a minute. This poor man, this cursed man is now at Abraham's side. That's heretical. That's, that's blasphemy. But his name means God saved him and lifted him up. And he's at Abraham's side. And he's not in the periphery. He's not in the back of the room or the back of the crowd looking over but everybody's head. He is right there with Abraham in the place of honor. And this goes against their theology. And they knew, they knew Abraham was righteous. This is the amazing thing. This, this is what Romans points out. I want you to understand this. That in the very beginning here, um, the Jews, they had Abraham. And as far as time in history that Abraham lived, it's easy to remember because it's the flip side of now in B.C. 2,000 years before Christ, Abraham lived. Okay? Um, and according to... Uh, Genesis 15, 6, it said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. Okay? And the book of Romans talks about righteousness because that's the big thing. We want to be made, made by right. We want to be made right by God. And so they all know that Abraham was righteous. Abraham was righteous. And that happened then. Um... <clears throat> and he was righteous because he believed God. He believed what God had said, what he had promised. Um, he believed in the Genesis 3 promise of uh, the coming Redeemer of all people, um, of crushing the head of Satan. The coming Messiah is what he believed in, the coming Redeemer. Um, and he believed everything else that God added to that, and it was credited to him for righteousness, and it was not of works. So Abraham was then, and then you've got Moses, who was given the law, and that was around 1000 B.C. And these Jews during... We'll just use zero for right now. Um, during the time of Jesus, the age where we're reading, they look back and they're saying, it is the law that makes people righteous. Okay? But they don't understand if that's the case. Abraham didn't have the law, right? This point's made in Hebrews, in Galatians, in the book of Romans, all three of them. That you're, 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 you're using the law to make a righteousness for yourself just makes you unrighteous. It reveals that you're righteous. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but this is a point of Scripture. It's saying the Jews had it wrong in thinking that the law would save them. It would never save them. It would condemn them even more. Um, because everybody from... Everybody in history, even today, same thing. God said, I have made a righteousness known by sending Christ, who would die for sinners, um, and, and give them this righteousness, impute it to our account. He'd put it in our bank account. He would take bankrupt, wretched people and give us Jesus' own righteousness to us. Okay? So... So they knew Abraham was righteous with God, but they thought he did it by works. Um, and so this man is with Abraham, this wretched man, poor man. Um, but... If, if you look at this passage right here, um, it said the rich 
man also died and he was buried buried he had a nice big funeral where everybody probably gave him the great eulogies of saying what a great man he is he had a whole burial it doesn't say anything about the poor man he was just wonderfully taken off to heaven perfectly but this man had the great burial uh, the great send-off but in verse 23 it says in hell where he was in torment he looked up and saw Abraham far away. It's, it's like he just, he's there coming to a realization of where he is. He's not crying out, where am I? Why am I here? I want you to notice that. He doesn't question, what's going on? God, you were wrong. Why am I here? It says he was tormented and he's calling out for just any hint of relief from this torment. And, and, and the point here is that he did not question why he was there. He knows full well why he was there. That's the realization of hell is all of a sudden um, in every description of hell when it, I'm trying to think of different verses. One says it, it's um, It's where the worm never dies. And that was a saying that meant that the conscious, the conscious, your conscience is completely exposed. Everything about you is revealed. All the sin is right there in your face. And the worm is wriggling and it's being in front of you completely. So this man knows the weight of his sin before a holy God. It's a complete realization and a constant torture of guilt and shame. When you've done something wrong, you know when your conscience just, just starts searing your, your, you with guilt and you feel that shame and you just want to hide. You know what I'm talking about. That's what's continual here, of no release. The agony, the, the pain of this, the realization of what you have done. And so this man is not crying out, why am I here? Why have you put me here? How dare you? He is crying out, I need relief. And he sees Abraham. He says, oh, Send, send that man and just have him dip just a drop of water to put in my mouth to relieve me of this pain and this anguish. Now, there's so much that comes out of this too. He's like, um, he's still looking at this. He, he has, this brings out the point that hell is punitive. It's not reformative. It, it's not there to reform people. Like our justice system, we, we hope would reform people. They would sit in jail and think about what they've done and come out and say, I'm, I'm going to change my life. I mean, that's what we hope. But we also want it to be punitive to say they need to be put away and away from society. But this is God's complete punitive where they're going there to be punished for, <coughs> for their sin, for their shame, for everything. And when they go there, they are not repentant in any way. They are not like, oh God, forgive me now, forgive me. No, they're, they're stuck in where they're at and they're dealing with guilt and shame forever. And to prove that, he says to Father Abraham, send that poor man to me. In other words, in his mind, this is still a man who is a servant, who is nothing. You tell him to go get a drop of water and just give that to me. You understand? He doesn't see anything differently in his eyes. At all. And when Jesus talks about hell in a place 
that is utter darkness because we have the lake of fire where it's pictured as, as burning, but it's not a physical fire burning and consuming. It is a, a perpetualness of, of this place of darkness. And one word that's used in the New Testament is Gehenna, which is the burning pile outside of Jerusalem. Everybody took their trash. They threw the bodies of criminals in there. I mean, just continual burning, just smelly, filthy, terrible place. So when you, Jesus used the word Gehenna, it's a place of burning perpetualness. It's not so much the fire and flame, because when hell is mentioned, it's a place of darkness, a place of no love, no grace, nothing of God that is just void of Him and left to the shame, the guilt of who that person is. Of And it's a place of weeping where they're crying out for that dry, uh, any relief and gnashing of teeth and, and, and that speaks of their still gnashing against God and his decisions and his ways and against Christ. So this, this rich man is experiencing sort of in a way everything that the man had experienced, the, the poor man had experienced in life and had dealt with, that this man dealt with torment in life and yet sought mercy and had the punishment paid through Christ, through trusting in God. Um, we'll have to continue next week, but um, we want to look at the reasons now. Um, we want to cross off this list why this man is in hell. The specific reasons. Because if, I, if you just read this story, you think, well, he was just a rich man. They all deserve to go to hell. Okay? That's not the case. We have to go through that list. You know, he was a Jew, or maybe this man was a Gentile, maybe... We have to look at all those things and say specifically, what is it that sent him there and what would have kept him from there? Because it's good for us to know this for our life as well as as we share with others. This is the reality. This is the reality. The righteousness of Christ is everything. And it is... It is the way we are saved. We are saved by grace by Christ and His death on the cross, and we're saved for good <coughs> works. Ephesians 2 says we have been saved for good fruit in our life, to be fruitful, to show the blessing of God. But that doesn't get us that righteousness, that work, that following whatever set of laws somebody sets up for us. It is understanding we cannot keep God's holy law. We are sinners. We are petakas. We are bankrupt before Him. Okay. What a great gift we've been given. I'm telling you. This righteousness that we've been given. And this is the gift we have to share with other people. It is the most loving thing we can do. We have to understand that. It is the hardest, most uncomfortable thing to do. But the more you understand it, the more you weep over the people that you know are headed in that direction, the more it pushes us to pray, to speak, to not hold back. Okay? Because this is reality. Christ is telling us. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing to us your grace. I have to say thank you for revealing to us your justice your righteousness, your perfection, and your hell. Father, I don't desire anyone to go there, and I know you don't. You said you are patient with all people, wanting them to repent and come to know you. So Father, I ask, I, I plead to you that you use us in this amazing way to pull people off that wide path 
and lead them into that narrow way of Christ that in Him is found that righteousness, that, that forgiveness, that perfection before you that can only be found in you. So Father, thank you for each one here today and I pray for them. Pray for blessing and in the tough times that they'll continue to look to you as, as Linda talked to to you today, about you today that they are knowing that you are working and they can trust in you. Thank you, Lord, for your continual faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.